When the goldfish was asked, how's the water? It responded, what's water? Like the goldfish, our reality might be so all-consuming that we too fail to step back and truly comprehend it. In the social sciences, this stepping back and questioning of known reality is central to a scientific method called critical inquiry. In this short video, we're going to take a critical look at sustainability. What shifts in social and economic systems might be needed for a more sustainable future? The context for our ecological crisis is most significantly market capitalism and its growth imperative. To keep this profit-reliant system afloat, we have a global economy that does its level best to achieve 3% growth every year, so a system doubling in size every 24 years. This doubling of growth has equated to ever-increasing resource extraction and ecological problems. In response to these problems, there's now the widespread belief that renewable technology will allow us to continue with this growth and make it sustainable, an idea known as green growth. Having established this growth context and the attempt to green it, let's now take a critical look at this system to see what new doors of understanding might open. Limits to Growth is a body of research offering a powerful critique of growth and the attempt to green it. This scholarship demonstrates that decades of growth have corresponded with many ecological problems, such as increases in carbon, loss of biodiversity, plastic waste and soil, water and air toxicity. A central finding of this analysis is that because the global economy is continually growing, this increase in global impact has occurred despite the increasing uptake of renewables. For example, even though wind and solar generated more than 10% electricity globally in 2021, because of growth of the entire economic system, power from coal also rose 9% in the same year to a new record high. We really believe that that's our saviour. And, and I think a lot of people, I know amongst my friends, it's like, well, yeah, that, that's the next step. We need to green everything. And it's like, is this not? Like, we need to, we need to stop, we need to reevaluate and look at what's happening in our world. In terms of what is happening in our world, limits to growth literature also points to a problem with renewables themselves pointing out that while wind and sunlight certainly are green, harnessing and distributing this clean energy to meet our growth fixated energy needs is not. For example, just the 2,000 wind turbines that the US wants to install by 2030 will require the mining of over 100,000 tonnes of copper, plus millions of tonnes of steel, aluminium, fiberglass, cobalt, rare earth metals and other materials such as concrete. So what then will be the ecological impacts of even bigger green growth projects, like a transition of the world's 1.5 billion cars to electric? Can already seriously degraded ecosystems cope with the huge resource extraction now needed to manufacture and power these cars using renewables, let alone the 3 billion cars predicted by 2050? What about the roads and the urban sprawl? None of this is to mention the energy needs of other growth sectors, such as computing and electronics, retail, manufacturing and tourism. All industries that must ceaselessly find consumer markets to meet their profit growth objectives. This necessitates wasteful resource use, such as we see with planned obsolescence. It's another way to jump on that capitalism gravy train. Is to, it's green. It's you know, seen green things ever. Like on, on products, like how is that green? Like it's in plastic. It's how is that green? Um, and as we know, like all the you know all the natural resources that go into making things to create green energy, is just you know our, our growth. It's it's yeah too little, too late. We must also remember not only are rich countries committed to more growth but big developing countries like China and India are also now reliant on more growth too. There are still billions of people who need to main, like, attain a, a level of living that we would deem acceptable. And so it's just not possible that we can live these, these huge lifestyles that we're currently living. If we take the lesson from the goldfish anecdote and step back from our known economic paradigm, 
might we see that green technology could certainly be part of a more sustainable future, but that it might not be able to support the reality we've become so accustomed to, perpetual growth on a finite planet. Limits to Growth Scholarship sees the need for the over-consuming regions of the world to not only stop growing, but to also initiate a process of planned contraction of our resource demands. This is a process known as degrowth. So exactly where is degrowth supposedly needed? According to Oxfam, the top 10% of global wealth holders are producing a staggering 52% of global carbon. This is a good indicator of this group's general resource use, and so they are an obvious focal point for degrowth. But just who are these top 10%? You may be surprised to learn that it is anyone with a net wealth of US $109,000 or more. This would include many of us in the developed world. Indeed, many of us qualify in the top 1% of global wealth holders, needing only 1 million US net wealth to qualify. So just how much degrowth is required of this top 10%? The UN's Emissions Gap Report gives us an idea, calling on those of us in the top 10% of global wealth holders to reduce our carbon footprint from where it is now at around 20 tonnes per person per year to around 2 tonnes by 2030. I'm, the, I'm in the top 10%. My parents are the top 1%. And, that, and, and most people I know are in the top 10% and uh, the UN projection that we need to get to 2.1 carbon, carbon, tonnes of carbon per annum per person, I find really overwhelming. And also like just that, that stark reality of this mm. is what's happening, that's what we need to get to and that's just in the next eight years. Mm. And to be honest, I find I, it, it, it's so scary. As scary as it might well be, Along with the transition to renewables, the UN says this drastic reduction in developed world wealth is crucial for keeping temperature increases under 1.5 degrees and to create the right foundation for global resource justice. Green growth doesn't work. That's the one that I didn't know. And that's the one that makes you go, okay, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a changing of lifestyles, a changing of culture um, is what's necessary so that's the key that I took away. We do need to as individuals completely change our lifestyles and be prepared for that and I'm not sure that people are. People are very ready to just blame the companies and and politicians. And it took so long for people to start saying like oh yeah we should probably do something so now I think for people to be told like that's not enough we actually need to do a whole lot more like we need this massive structural change in our society. I don't, I'm not sure if people are ready to hear that, which is scary and we're already seeing the impacts of, of climate change. However necessary this resource contraction or degrowth of the top 10% might be, reducing developed world wealth like this might seem very improbable in our current social and economic reality. Everyone's kind of focused on like, I need money now because I need to live, I need to pay my bills. So even if we want to kind of look to look on the bigger level and think like what we're doing is killing our planet, we almost like don't have the opportunity to do that. And it is that, that like politics of paralysis of, do we kind of suffer now for the benefit of our planet or do we just keep ourselves afloat and like hurt the planet long term? While the need for degrowth is clearly urgent, to achieve it, we first need to face a major hurdle. Currently, we must simply continue to grow our economy to avoid the many social problems that stem from economic decline, such as unemployment. How can governments or any one of us embrace degrowth when we need the jobs that depend on consumerism? For instance, COVID's huge impact on the tourist industry had the positive effect of reducing some of the most unnecessary consumer carbon emissions associated with their air travel. But it also put thousands of people out of work, exposing them to serious economic and social problems. In the face of this immediate economic survival imperative, our longer term climate imperative is all too often set aside by governments and by many of us individually. You know, rents are high and you know, everything, life is hard by us, the standards that we're used to sort of thing. 
and you know, uh, and everything I think around is causing a sort of a degrounding. So people are not as open to things that would mean change, and that's again that's the how, yeah, how do we overcome that? The politicians do need to pledge that they will grow, otherwise they won't get power. And probably on the one hand, they understand that there is ecological impact of that growth. But I guess that always comes secondary to the economy and to, um, yeah, just the, the promises they have to make. Um, it's, yeah, it's a survival imperative, I guess, for just everyday people. What would you say to them directly this morning? Well, I'd say pull your heads in, get out of the way and uh, stop hurting other people going about their lives, uh, running their businesses and uh, standing in the way of growing our economy. Yeah, there is a real tension between the need for like economic growth and the devastation that that causes on the environment, which is real. This tension between economic and ecological survival has created a sort of politics of paralysis, where our reliance on jobs and growth is in serious tension with the planet's limits to growth. To get to the heart of this unworkable tension, we must deepen our critical inquiry to trace our reliance on this growth market paradigm back to its origins. What we find when we do this may be a surprise to many of you, it's capitalism's very first privatisation, the privatisation of land. While there are examples of feudal land domination and ownership as far back as antiquity, market capitalism's first privatisation largely began with 16th century European land enclosures. Spreading through colonisation, people the world over were forced out of the oldest form of human settlement local collaboration on land commons, and onto private land. The key point here is that when something we all need for survival, land, becomes privatised, we then have no choice but to sell our labour to the market, so that we might buy or rent it back to secure housing and food. I want to buy a house one day because like, that's what gives you financial security in like, this current economic framework, and I want that. So I know that like, I am going to work five days a week even if it means like, even if it means I'm contributing to an unsustainable um, lifestyle. I mean, mortgage is, it's, uh, what's it, debt for life, debt to death, or something, that's what it means in Latin. And um, it really is that you have to spend, you have to concentrate all your energy on, you know, the Australian dream. This land foundation has huge implications for most of us, affecting what we do for work, how much we work, our need for a car, as well as a host of other lifestyle decisions. This often means that any attempt at dropping out of consumerism first involves a whole lot of dropping in to skewer this massive, often lifelong, cost of land. For me, it means I'm going to be working for the rest of my life, five days a week. Like, I, like even currently, I don't have time to help out my community. I don't have time to volunteer. I don't have time to grow my own food. I don't have time to do that. So I'm, because I'm always working, so that means I have to kind of buy things and contribute to like a lifestyle that I know is unsustainable. So, land privatisation sits at the proverbial base of the iceberg. It is what most fundamentally makes us reliant on economic growth for the jobs to buy or rent housing. We have now reached limits to this economic growth in that it's causing ecological breakdown. The, the privatisation of land, I guess I understood that but some way back in the recesses of my brain but I have to bring that to the forefront going, hang on, actually, yeah, that's foundational to everything. Since doing the unit, um, like I've been to a few climate change exhibitions and um, talks and that sort of thing and they never touch on the land issue and they'll talk about all these things sort of around it but, but never get to the heart of it and I guess yeah, after knowing that, it's hard to unsee it. It's like, yeah, it's obvious that this is at the heart of it and no one's talking about it. We might conclude from this analysis that for reasons of sustainability and social justice, that a different type of land and housing opportunity is needed. Given this reality, what might an alternative look like? 
there are many conceptions of land relationships, which means we don't necessarily have to choose between capitalism's land privatisation and some sort of state socialism. For instance, might we learn something from Indigenous heritage of local collaboration on land commons as an option alongside private land and the need for market opportunity? Yeah, I guess like listening to elders speak about sustainability and like what they call like the old ways. Like I've always, I guess, had that connection between sustainability and Indigenous philosophies, but I suppose until this unit, I hadn't ever imagined that like Western society would actually accept those philosophies as valid. The more we play into those Indigenous philosophies of life, the more we can decolonize. My understanding of it is that, you know, um, there's so much privatisation of land. And if you think about more traditional, more sustainable models of land usage, you know, they were, the land was part of that community, not something to bounce off and use, you know, to, to acquire. Um, so changing changing the narrative of land usage. I think it's all linked in, and the privatisation of land, and we're on stolen land. Like that, that's my impetus, it's like this is not, you know, and the people that, the people that were here before white colonisation, before white invasion, didn't even own the land either, that's not the relationship they had with the land. Central here is the recognition that land is not essentially a market good, but as with air and water, more of a social or common good, provided by nature and needed by all. It's it's so strange to think that we can just buy a piece of, of, of land. Like, what is the difference between a piece of land and air? Like, it is just like a, it should be seen as a human right, as a common good. Yeah, I'm very much a fan of like the land issue and like especially commons, because yeah. um, I do think that's a big issue. People wouldn't be like working so much, earning all this money to spend on like consumables, like if we just had land. As unlikely as restoring local collaboration on common land might sound, something very close to this already exists. The example is tenant self-help in public housing. Secure access to public land has empowered some public residents to participate in programs such as community food gardens, resource repair and share programs, housing management, maintenance, and in the UK, even housing construction. In so much as these residents are locally collaborating on common land, increasingly developing self-help skills to meet their own needs, they are participating in perhaps the oldest pre-market way of living. I don't know anyone my age that actually thinks they're gonna own a house one day. Like, even with a double income, stable jobs, like we're probably not gonna own a house because it's that expensive. I think that will push people towards more public housing. Even the cost of, like the general cost of living at the moment, like with vegetables, like I think that would push people more towards like community gardens. Realistically, we're not going to get out of our, like our economic or our social issues by doing the exact same thing we've been doing for 20 years. So I think having those kind of out of the box ideas, like expanding social housing, um, yeah, I definitely think that's something to keep an eye out for in policy over the next like 10 years. In a world where many people are unable to achieve security through the market, tens of millions in the global north and billions of people in the global south, where they are falling victim to globalisation of labour, technological job redundancy, homelessness, and increasingly, there's a growing group likely to find themselves without market opportunity because of ecological limits to growth. For many of these people, commons housing and productive collaboration could represent a significant new opportunity in material security. Where welfare and now a universal basic income is often proposed to help secure basic needs, might self-help on commons mean people need a much smaller income and therefore become much less market reliant and more sustainable. Could such an option also be preferable for the leaders and wealthy in society who push for alternatives to the increasing cost of welfare and who want to avoid the unrest that growing poverty inevitably creates? Um, there would need to be that kind of restructure of like the way we look at social housing. How can we actually be productive? How can we, like how can we make this, I guess, better for our society? And if more people are doing it, um, I guess the government would Kind of want to find ways to like make it more productive for them and part of that would be community 
like community development projects. So. Could this option help balance the downsides and complement the many benefits of our market society? In the critical inquiry we have undertaken, we have stood back from our current growth paradigm and the attempt to green it with green growth. We challenge these green growth assumptions with the insights provided by Limits to Growth and looked at the evidence for the need for degrowth amongst the wealthiest 10%. This led us to investigate the politics of paralysis, why, despite present dangers, we're all dependent on even more market growth to survive. This took us on a deep dive into the foundations of our dependence on this growth market society. The first, privatisation, land privatisation. Finally, we looked at a possible way to provide an alternative to our reliance on unsustainable growth by restoring perhaps the oldest model of settlement, local collaboration on commons, but in a modern, urban context. Our society can function in other ways. Societies have functioned in other ways for thousands of years before. So it is possible. Aside from like opening up my eyes to like what genuine sustainability looks like. It's also like shown me that we're not just doomed, like there are other ways, it's just a matter of like implementing that structural change. With so many major problems on the horizon, could this oldest form of human connection to land and to each other help us balance our reliance on growth and help us respond to the many problems it's causing? Might many benefits come from combining the best of both market and commons systems, helping us achieve a future better than anywhere we've been before?